Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Pruitt. We are continuing with our trauma theme for the month. This lecture is just going to focus on basic principles of trauma and how to approach a trauma patient and run an effective trauma resuscitation. Hopefully a lot of it's just review, but it gives me a chance to just kind of highlight some very important points when we're considering trauma patients and their pathophysiology. I know that trauma can be very messy. It can be very dramatic. A lot of times there's a lot of emotions and blood and mess involved, and it can be a pretty chaotic scene. But I really want to emphasize that we can really make trauma very simple. If you can boil it down to just a couple of points, you can kind of get past all the drama, all the blood, all the chaos, and get right to the point and take really good care of these patients. Of course, whenever we're approaching a traumatic scene, we need to think about safety first. I know that we do a very good job with this, but it um, can never be overemphasized that we need to take care of ourselves first before we can take care of others. So if it's a car wreck, make sure um, you've got traffic blocked. If it is a scene with a gun or a knife or potentially dangerous, make sure that the police have secured the scene first. And any other hazards that you need to think about on all the traumatic situations we go to, just please, please, please take care of yourselves. As you approach the patient and you know that the scene is safe, um, again, keeping it very simple, we're going to do X, A, B, C, or some people might be more familiar with the MARCH acronym, but all it really boils down to is that your first priority as you approach your patient should be controlling any major hemorrhage, whether that's direct pressure or a tourniquet, exposing them, find where they're bleeding, and make that stop. As you're working on that, your next priority is going to be your ABCs. So address that airway. Are they breathing? And what's their circulation like? The answer to those four questions is going to dictate your next several actions from here. But those are the most important things to address very, very quickly. And I know I just went over X, ABC. So X is for exsanguinating hemorrhage. A is for airway. B is for breathing. C is for circulation. Those are your top four priorities. Now, if you're using the MARCH acronym, it's essentially the same thing, but M stands for massive hemorrhage, A is for airway, R is for respirations, C for circulation, and H for hypothermia or hypotension, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Priority number one, as we mentioned, with either the X or the M in March is to stop the bleeding. 80% of bleeding can be controlled with direct pressure, but please, please, please don't be afraid to use a tourniquet. If it's just you and your partner on scene and you've got a million other things to manage and you see that there's pulsatile bleeding or a massive amount of bleeding, throw a tourniquet on there. We know that they're very safe and they're very effective. For bleeding, they absolutely save lives. These are a basic life support skill, so any of the providers that we have on scene with either fire or ambulance, and even police now are carrying them as well, please don't be afraid to use them. You can actually save extremities and stop death by using tourniquets. Make sure when you place a tourniquet that you're exposing the skin underneath. You're placing them as close as you can to the core of the body. So proximally means close to the core. So either close to the armpit or close to the groin. Make sure you have all the clothing and anatomy out of the way so that you can get a nice tight seal over that long bone and occlude the bleeding that's happening below where the tourniquet is. Our next most important priority, and I can't emphasize this enough, is excellent airway skills. So it only takes four to six minutes of tissues not getting enough oxygen until there can be irreversible heart or brain or lung damage. And we know usually in our severely injured trauma patients, they already have a lot of underlying damage to their organs. And one of the most important things we can do is provide them with supplemental oxygen to help support those vital organs and get them to the hospital in good shape. It really does help decrease mortality if you have excellent airway management skills. So if you don't think they're breathing effectively, you can help them with a bag valve mask. If they're unconscious, unresponsive, you can attempt to use an LMA, whatever it takes to quickly address that airway and prevent as much hypoxia as you can to protect those organs. Now, things I'd like to emphasize when we're talking about airway is just five tips for perfect bag valve mask. 
I know when I walk up on a scene, a lot of times it's our new firefighters that are out there managing the airway and doing the bagging. And I want you to know that this is the most, if not the most, one of the most important skills on a scene is providing the BVM for somebody. When you're doing this, you want to make sure you have your hands in a thumbs down technique with two hands sealing the mask to the face. Ideally, you have two people, and I know that we have enough people on our trauma scenes to have two people on the airway. One person can be bagging, and the other person makes sure you've got that good seal and you have good mechanics with your hands. By doing the thumbs down technique from the person's head, you're going to have a little bit less hand cramping and you're going to be able to provide a more adequate seal to make sure all of that air is actually getting into the airway and not out to the periphery. Don't be afraid to use your adjuncts if they're indicated, a nasal pharyngeal airway or an oropharyngeal airway if the patient will tolerate it and there's not terrible facial trauma to make it contraindicated. One of the most important things I've learned over the years when I'm bagging people is if you look at the hands on this picture here, you can see that the person is not mashing the mask into the face, but they're actually lifting the jaw into the mask. And the mandible is actually perfectly angled for this. If you're using the thumbs down technique, you can wrap your fourth and your fifth finger around the angle of the mandible and actually just do a nice little jaw thrust there. So you're lifting the jaw and all of those soft tissues off of the posterior oropharynx into the mask as opposed to just smashing the mask on the face and then occluding all of that posterior airway. So pay close attention to what you're doing with your hands and how you're holding the mask. And one of the best ways to ensure that you're bagging effectively is to please, please, please use capnography. That's going to tell you if you're providing adequate ventilation for that patient. So as you approach this patient, you are looking for any exsanguinating hemorrhage that you might need to control, but this is my quick 15 seconds of primary assessment that tells me how sick this patient is. So the minute I walk up to them, I'm trying to make eye contact. I see if they're sitting, if they're laying there, if they're unresponsive, and if I can make eye contact or talk to them, I say, tell me your name. That immediately, if they're able to answer my question, tells me that their GCS is probably 15 and that their airway is intact. So you've, within just one question, been able to really do a pretty comprehensive assessment of your patient's mental status and their airway status which leads to the next point of assessing bilateral breath sounds. So this is either the B in our ABC acronym or the R in our MARCH acronym. Just quickly listen to their chest. Do they have bilateral breath sounds? Do I need to be worried about pneumothorax? I know sometimes on scenes it's very difficult and loud and noisy to actually try to listen to breath sounds, but you can expose their chest and look and see, is their chest rise and are they breathing effectively? What other breath sounds do you hear? Do you hear strider? Do you hear some sort of gurgling? Is it agonal? All that takes is a quick look and listen to make that sick or not sick decision. And as you're doing that and trying to expose their chest and looking for chest rise and listening for respiratory sounds, you can quickly grab their wrist and assess a radial pulse. And if the radial pulse is absent, then you know you absolutely have a very, very sick patient and you need to go. But you might have a very strong and thready pulse, which tells you that you still need to be worried about shock, but they're not quite clamped down yet and you still have a little bit of time. Whereas if they have a strong and regular radial pulse that feels normal, maybe you have a little bit more time to do an assessment on scene. So just these three things that can be done in 15 seconds will give you a really good idea of how sick your patient is. It's important to emphasize the stages of shock. I know you've seen this diagram before and we've all had to memorize it in books. Really the takeaway point here is as you're grabbing that radial pulse, and you're asking yourself, how sick is this patient and how much of a hurry do I need to be in? If it feels fast, faster than normal, realize that you're probably already in stage two or stage three shock, which means they might have lost anywhere from one to two liters of blood. And that can be anywhere from their exsanguinating hemorrhage or anywhere in their leg, their chest, their pelvis, their abdomen, where else they might lose blood. The other thing you can assess very quickly is if they're anxious and confused, a lot of times that can also go with class 2 or class 3 shock. So it's, again, just by grabbing that radial pulse, you're going to have a very quick assessment of how bad their shock is and if shock is present and how quickly you need to move. So the answer to that question, radial pulse present or not, or radial pulse fast, or their mental status, 
is going to drive you to your decision of whether you just load and go or whether you stay here and work a little bit harder on scene to get a better assessment of your patient. Really what it comes down to in your seriously injured trauma patient is you need to assess for life-threatening injuries and there's only two things you should do on scene. Number one is control the bleeding and number two is control the airway. After that, if you've got a severely injured patient, you should be loading them and going and everything else can be done in the back of the ambulance. So make sure you're controlling that bleeding right away because we don't want to get behind the eight ball on their hemorrhagic shock. So that should be step number one. Step number two, we'll talk about hypoxia later but this is deadly in trauma patients and you want to very aggressively treat this early so manage that airway while you're on scene and then get going. It is important to consider the mechanism of trauma. If they need a C collar, put that on. That's going to complicate your airway a little bit but I know you all are expert in doing this and as you roll the patient if you decide that you need a backboard even if it's just to facilitate patient movement that's fine but take advantage of rolling that patient to assess their spine and get a quick neurological status if this is a patient that can communicate with you and follow your directions this is a perfect time to say hey can you wiggle your toes can you give me a thumbs up with both hands one that'll tell you that they can follow directions and two it means if they're able to wiggle their toes pretty much as a rough neurological exam that entire spine is intact and you don't need to worry about any kind of neurogenic shock or bad cord injury. So after you've decided whether this is a load and go or stay and play kind of situation, we all know about our head to toe secondary survey. If you don't have time to get past that first survey, that's fine. Manage your airway. If that's all you can do is just manage that airway and stop the bleeding, then that's all you can do and that's fine. Those are the two most important priorities. But if your patient is a little bit less sick, then you can move on to your secondary survey, totally expose your patient, look for all the possible injuries, touch and feel everything. Is there anything on the head that you missed? Do they have any neck pain? How about their chest, their arms, their belly, their legs? Good neuro exam. Look at everything and try not to miss anything if you have time. But just remember, if you don't have time, that's okay. Do the most important things first. One of the things that frequently gets overlooked with trauma patients is that hypothermia can be very deadly for them as well, almost just as deadly as hypoxia. So make sure after you expose them and look for, in all the nook and crannies for all the types of injuries that they might have, make sure you're making every effort after that to keep them warm and covered. We've spoken about the triangle of death before. It involves hypothermia, acidosis, and coagulopathy. Um, basically, as the patient is bleeding to death, there's fewer tissues that are getting oxygen delivery, and so they become ischemic and build up acid, which leads to clotting factors not being able to do what they do and be able to stop the bleeding. And so you have more tissues that aren't getting perfusion, tissues that are going to continue to bleed because the clotting cascade is not working right and then being cold makes both of those things even worse because with hypothermia your blood vessels are going to be clamped down and that's even less blood delivery to the tissues and also with hypothermia that also changes the configuration a lot of the proteins in your clotting cascade and again makes those clotting factors where they're not going to be able to work as well as normal all of this potentiate each other and can lead to worsening of your patient status and even death. As you're controlling bleeding and managing your airway like an expert, like I said before, if you only have time to do those two things, that's fine. Those are the most important things. But realize that vital signs are vital and any episodes of hypertension or hypoxia in the field can indicate a high rate of mortality. So keep a close eye on that heart rate, keep a close eye on that mental status, and if you have time, keep a close eye on that blood pressure because that's gonna really be the key to tell you how that patient's doing. So just one set, if you have time, just one set is enough, but if you have more time, make sure you're keeping a close eye on those and continuing to reassess their vital signs. If you have time, you can get a history. If you don't, that's fine too. Really with trauma, a medical history isn't going to change it too much. Probably the biggest question that the hospital is going to ask you is whether or not this patient is anticoagulated and if they're taking medicines that are going to make them more prone to bleeding. The reason that's important is because if we know if they're on blood thinners, there's certain medicines we can give to help 
reverse bleeding and make their blood not so thin. Also important would be asking about allergies or trying to find out about those just so the hospital doesn't give them any medication that's going to worsen any underlying conditions that they have. Don't waste time on scene getting an IV or an IO. That's something that can be done in the back of an ambulance. I know it's a little difficult when the ambulance is barreling down the road and it's bumpy in the back. If you've got a sick enough patient, don't be afraid to jump to an IO early. Really, probably if these patients are super sick, what they need is to get to a surgeon and get to the hospital. So um, don't waste time trying to get an IV. Have a low threshold to use an IO. Remember with your fluid resuscitation, I know back in the day we were taught that every trauma patient gets two liters of fluid by large bore IVs. What we're learning is that it's okay to not flood them with fluid, that fluid actually dilutes their clotting factors and makes it more difficult for the bleeding to stop. And so what we want to do is aim for a blood pressure between 90 and 100. The reason that's important is that it will provide enough fluid in the system to perfuse the organs, but not so much that we're diluting all the clotting factors and making their bleeding worse. If you have a patient that's relatively stable and all of your other priorities are taken care of, please don't be afraid to treat their pain. Trauma hurts, and we want to be kind and compassionate and take good care of our patients. So if you have time, um, make sure you're addressing any pain needs that the patient might have. That includes splinting. So splints make broken bones feel a little bit better by decreasing that movement and the, the stress that's occurring on the broken bones. Just important to note that before you place any splints, make sure you're checking a pulse and movement and sensation before and after you place the splint. As we're thinking about trauma resuscitation, I was thinking about mass casualty triage, and it just so happens that we use the START triage in our system. And if you look at how we grade patients when there's a whole lot of them, we look at their respirations, their pulse, and their mental status. And there's a reason for that, because it's one of the earlier slides I talked about. You can walk up to them, say, hey, what's your name? That's going to tell you their mental status right away. Are they breathing and what's their pulse? And so if you practice basically this kind of start triage on every trauma scene you go to, if you ever have to respond to an MCI, it'll kind of be second nature to do this exact same assessment when there's more patients than just one or two. If you look at the triage tag here that we have in our guidelines, you move the walking wounded off to the side and then assess the patients that are lying there and can't respond to your orders. As you walk up, assess the respirations. If the respirations are over 30, that automatically makes them a red tag or an immediate patient. As you're assessing respirations, you can grab that wrist and feel for a pulse. If you don't feel a radial pulse, we already know that that's already class three shock. You can try to control that bleeding right away and make them a red tag as well. And then you, based on mental status as you're assessing that patient, if they're not able to follow your commands or they're unresponsive, that also makes them a red tag. If they don't fall in any of those red categories, then that makes them a yellow and they're delayed and they can wait for further evaluation later as you're assessing the rest of the scene. As you're on your way into the hospital and you've done all of your interventions, the things that the hospital likes to hear over the radio and what the trauma team likes to hear in the recess bay is a really quick age mechanism, injuries, vitals, and interventions. So it would probably go something like this. I have a 27-year-old female who was hit by a car. She's got, obviously, bilateral deformities to her femurs. She's got a scalp lack neck pain and is unresponsive. Vitals are heart rate of 130, blood pressure of 90 over 50, oxygen saturation of 91 on room air improved to 98 with an LMA. That's all any questions. So a good report should take anywhere from 15 to 20 seconds and include all the quick information that the hospital will be interested in. Uh, those are good to practice every once in a while because it's not easy to just rattle them off. So as you're driving in, try to try to think about how to make your report nice and concise. Just quick review, there are five places to bleed to death. I know you all have seen this slide before, but try to assess these places and think about where your patient's bleeding and how you can control it. So we know that immediately if they have an exsanguinating hemorrhage on any of their extremities, we are going to control that with either direct pressure or a tourniquet. That's easy. We can do that. You can splint a femur fracture. You can use a pelvic binder for pelvic fractures. 
But really, if there's any life-threatening chest or abdominal trauma, that means you should move even faster because the only people that can help stop that bleeding are going to be a trauma surgeon. And that's all that I have. Please let the 7-8 or myself know if you have any questions.